Really excited to introduce our podcast guest today. She has been named by Sport360 as one of the top 100 most influential women in sport globally. She is the recipient of the Officer of New Zealand Order of Merit Award. She has worked with Fuji Xerox, Bank of New Zealand, Spark New Zealand, and she shares with us a lot of what she learned on that journey and how it shaped her for the future. She was the Chief Executive at Nepal New Zealand and was very influential in taking that from an amateur game to a fully professional game at the elite level. She then entered the very male-dominated uh, environment of the National Rugby League competition in Australia as its first female CEO of the Canterbury-Bankstown Bulldogs. And now she is the Chief Executive Officer at Rugby Australia. She also shares with her some of challenges that she faces from uh, alopecia through to how she deals with social media trolls. I am delighted to introduce Raylene Castle, not only an amazing woman leading from the front in Australia, Australasia, but also my sister. I think this will be my most uh, exciting podcast interview of a family member. Never know who else might make the list. That's right. Uh, <laughs> but certainly one um, so proud to do, having uh, seen a journey that started, well, started for me 45 years ago, for you a couple more. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, you know, um, I think plenty of people would uh, look at what you've achieved in your time and go a phenomenal amount of achievement in a, actually a really short career so far. Um, so, so cool to be able to have a chat to you today about uh, where your journey began, what you've achieved on the on the way through and, and what's happening. But to kick it off, I have got some a few rapid fire questions just for the audience to get you to know you a little bit better. Maybe the um, person they don't always see in front of the, the camera on the news, but uh, what else is going on? So rapid fire, uh, breakfast or dinner? Dinner. Um, I'm going to chuckle at this one, fruit or veggies? <laughs> veggies. <laughs> Family joke, people don't worry about uh, that one too much. On holiday, more likely to be bungee jumping or on a pool lounger? Uh, both. Uh, probably don't want to climb the mountain to the top of the bungee jump. Probably take the cable car and then bungee nice. jump down. So, yeah. Nice. So a bit of adrenaline and a bit of relax. <laughs> That's it's quite, uh, quite good. Okay. Uh, would we find you most often in trainers or heels? Uh, probably heels in mm. reality. Um, but it's, it is interesting the whole sort of movement now to business mm. casual where you can actually wear trainers more often. But as a f nearly 50 something female, I'm not sure yeah. that's quite appropriate. Yeah, I think you, you could have claimed mid 40s, couldn't you? Could have. You could have. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Friends might have called you out on that one. Real book or Kindle? Kindle, all the way. Yeah, why? Easy travel, download a book whenever I want, have five or six books going at the same time, articles, just like just the ease. And in actual fact, if I read a real book now, I feel like I'm cheating on my Kindle. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, cats or dogs? Uh, more cats. <laughs> <laughs> this interview is almost over. That's right, I know. Um, early riser or night owl? Uh, can be both. Can be both. Mm. So does that tell us something ne about your work schedule as you're normally doing both? Need to be both, yep. yeah. Yeah, it can't really be because of the amount of travel and the work and the requirement mm. to be. You've just got to be on early and then sometimes you've got to be on late too. So yeah. you just got to have the ability to do both. I mean, I love a sleep in, but if I've got to be up at doing something at six o'clock, I can you know be up at six o'clock functioning make it, make it and all over yeah. again. Like, do you even know what time zone you're in at the moment? <laughs> no, I've had five, <laughs> so, five time zones in five weeks, so I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. I just yeah. know that the alarm went off, it was time to get up, have a shower, clean my teeth yeah. and come Where start working, so yeah. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a pretty brutal routine. And more likely to find you watching a thriller or a comedy? Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, it depends what mood I'm in. Right, mm. right. Okay. If I've had, if, like I really enjoy a good thriller, but if I've had <clears throat> lots of really um, you know, busy time and lots of intense stuff going on, actually just to have the sort of mind-numbing um, opportunity to watch a comedy and just really laugh is yeah, what I'd probably choose. Yeah, bit of a quality rom-com. Yeah, 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 I do actually, I do like a rom-com, despite what people might think. <laughs> Nice. Now, uh, we'll certainly talk a bit about your career and what you've achieved, which has been phenomenal, but um, early aspirations for jobs when you were a, uh, a youngster? Well, mum and dad relay the story that uh, we were um, uh, in, the, in the car at the petrol station uh, and at Noble Corner, which is not there anymore, the petrol station in Bucklands Beach, and uh, that, and I said to, enthusiastically, when I grew up, I really want to be a service station attendant. 
yeah. um, which was sort of mum and dad politely said, oh, okay, well, that's good. Maybe your views might change yeah, over the time. But, yeah, that is one of the ones that uh, yeah, yeah. we always have a family laugh about. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a uh, still an, an important role, but uh, fair to say that your direction has moved somewhat away from that one. Well, the reality is now you pay extra, don't you, for someone well, to do. service your car because yeah, you yeah. think self-service, yeah, yeah. so you've yeah. you've got no choice but to but to do it yourself. So I suppose in some ways I, I do actually get to fulfil that task. So mm. yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah that's right, self-service. Yeah. Bonus, do you get the nice white coat to do it? Yeah, no, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, careers obviously been dominated heavily with sporting sporting roles, but you had a. Uh, strong corporate career before you had um, the sporting influence. Um, what did you learn in your corporate career that's been useful for you as you moved into your commercial sporting roles? Well, everything really. I think the the reality of a modern day sporting chief executive is it's not. It's very hard to sort of come into the entry level being a um, maybe a game development person and then work your way up to being chief executive because when you're running a Rugby Australia somewhere between 120 and 140 million dollars, depending on how revenue is a bit lumpy. Sure. And is that how much you're winning? <laughs> yeah, well, no, how much you're winning. Also, with World Cups, we play these test matches, and right. so right. the schedule is not consistent of how right. many games you play, so it makes it a bit um, lumpy. Um, so that. Um, when you go back to the corporate space, the opportunity to have um, lots of different experiences. And I think um, probably right from even from school um, into a career is I was always quite keen to be more of a generalist. So mm -hmm. do a bit of this and a bit of that and get the experience across different um, roles. I started my career at Xerox, did um, nearly 10 years at, at Fuji Xerox as it was. Um, and it was just one of those unbelievable companies. Um, American historical, um, great sales focus, yes. so really good sales yeah. training, uh, great marketing processes, really good product, product development. So all of those things that out of the, um, you know, the core uh, company focus, values, development, mm -hmm. culture, history, mm -hmm. all those mm -hmm. things. Um, did seven, probably about seven different jobs in nearly 10 years. So got the opportunity to work across sales, marketing, sponsorship, public relations, general management, technology, technical um, parts. And at the time you don't realise how yeah, valuable yeah, that is. Yeah. But when you start to bring it all together and you realise international um, engagement, you know, we were up in Singapore and Japan, those sorts of uh, enormously you know, beneficial mm. to, to learn all those different yeah. things. Um, and then you know, sort of as you get um, more opportunity and manage people and you know grow and those things. Um, so yeah, I, c I couldn't do what I do now yeah. unless I'd had that 15 mm -hmm. years in the commercial sector. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. And at what uh, time in your early career did you go, I want to be the person at the top of the tree? Uh, I'd, if I'm really honest, I, I didn't think, um, to me being a chief executive was, such a big thing. I didn't ever think when I was at school that I would end up being a chief executive because I was a, you know, I was a average, slightly above average student. Um, and I always thought the really, really smart people, the six subject ducks type people would be the people that end up as chief executive. Mm -hmm. So I probably never really um, thought about chief executive as the aspiration. What I always wanted was to be achieve as much as I could and, and get to that next job, really competitive mm -hmm. to want mm -hmm. to improve and improve. Mm -hmm. But then as you start to work more and more in the environment, you realise that it's not necessarily just the smartest people that are the most successful people. Um, so the leadership values that you develop, you know, through playing a lot of sport and being engaged, sort of bring different, you know, um, skills and experiences. So um, it probably wasn't, because um, I'd worked in really, really big corporates. Um, so um, obviously Xerox and then into, um, you know, Bank of New Zealand Telecom. I mean, those chief executives are seriously big um, uh, and successful chief executives. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really until the opportunity to think about what it'd be like to run a mid-sized company, which mm -hmm. is what Netball New Zealand was, sure. that being a chief executive really came to life for me. Mm. And was there a time when you went, hey, I really like corporate, but ultimately I feel like my destiny is more in a sporting organisation? Was that a moment that kind of dawned on you? Or? I think I think it always had, and I went through my corporate career, I'd had a couple of interviews in sporting roles previously, knowing that somewhere I always knew that's where I wanted to end up. But they just didn't, they didn't work for different reasons, yeah. either the role wasn't quite right or the remuneration or the package or the focus or any of that. Yeah. And um, I never forget, I was driving down Parnell Rise mm -hmm. 
and uh, Radio Sport, as the car was always tuned to, had uh, the announcement that the chief executive of Netball New Zealand had resigned. And by six o'clock that night, I'd made six phone calls to critical people who I knew were connected to that netball role, mm. who had a chance to at least, if, if not influence, at the very least, ensure that my name was um, in the mix. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they shot me off to the, to the formal recruitment process, but I'd still managed to unlock because of the networks and connections that I'd built um, over that time. And, you know, I'm a great... Um, believer in network networking, not not networking for networking's sake, yep. like the polite sort of yes. cocktail yes. thing. Yep. As I just you know, wasted time, but if you generally form those relationships that you can see, um, and it's it's not as calculated uh, for me. It's not as calculated as this because it's actually about friends and values and sharing things and learnings. Mm. But what you realise when you can when you bring those group of people together, they can help you open doors. Um, and advocate for you in a mm. way that being blind in a blind CV when no one knows you and it lands sure. on a desk doesn't, you know, it doesn't help. So, and when you bring a uh, reciprocal intent to to that network, you know, of uh, coming in with the intent of going, hey, how can I, how can I help you? Uh, how can we help each other? You know, it's a it's a thing that stands by you over time. Yeah, it does. Awesome. It does, and and you know there had, there has been many a time when Greg said to me, you know, do you really need to go and have that glass of wine after work? Um, but you know, t for two reasons that's good. One is because I think that network is, is invaluable, but it's also really good for your mental health when you when you go and catch up with those really yeah. good friends yeah. and people that mm -hmm. you can talk and debate and discuss stuff with, not w not with the view that they want to solve it for you, because that's one of my pet hates is. You go and catch up with people and they have no room and design to solve it. I'm not here. I'm yeah, capable of solving yeah, it. I'm just sort of, yeah. you know, trying to chew it over. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm all about, you know, getting to a solution. But, mm. you know, there is that sort of... It wasn't um, a doctor's appointment you were looking for. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So having and that... Do you have a, um, an opinion of where the value is? Is it in the wine or in the people? It's definitely in both for me. Both? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> strangely, I don't ever drink on my own. I'm not someone that ever enjoys a glass of wine. So the whole... Um, social value of being able to sit with someone that you um, like and trust that you mm -hmm. can enjoy their company and share a really good glass of wine or cocktail or whatever you're mm -hmm. drinking um, is a really important part of me decompressing from what is you know a really busy schedule. Mm -hmm. And in your uh, you know let's call them formative years which maybe doesn't sound so youthful now um, what's a, was there ch a challenge that uh, stands out for you that you like this was this was tough. This was something I didn't know how I was going to tackle, and I found a way through it. Does anything stand out for you in that zone? My things have probably been um, maybe not in my formative years. Probably I was probably you know lucky. Well, you know, great family, great support, um, great base, and then probably for me um, or for Greg and I not being able to have kids. So mm. that whole sort of moment where you're in that. Which way? Because you just assume you just assume that you're going to get sure. here and you get yep. here, and then you yep. have kids, and to have that moment where um, the IVF person looks at you and says, can't "You have can't it. have kids." Mm -hmm. um, that's the real moment where you have to reassess where your career is going to go. And I suppose you know, after you know a, a, t a tough few weeks, it was. I've clearly been put on this earth to do something else, and mm -hmm. so I just need to go and you know, and that's that's my own way of rationalising it and making it you know sort of real. When you get really difficult decisions in careers and and, and you know day to day operational work things, suddenly those some of those personal things that you have faced um, build a level of resilience that doesn't make some of the, the petty things that you deal with. It might be big in someone else's world, but in your world you mm. get a little bit mm. more sort of pragmatic about dealing mm. with. So that's my rationale about how I've dealt with some of those mm. things. So, And as a, uh, a close and sometimes further observer myself, seeing, you know, growing up together obviously, uh, one of my observations is that your ability to deal with adversity, no matter what it is, so whether you call it resilience or grit, um, it's definitely one of your characteristics I've seen that served you very, very well in, uh, in your time. Um, sport has been a, a big part of our family's life from right when we were, were young. Um, parents that have both been uh, international representatives in their, in their own right. Um, you've played representative sport uh, yourself. Um, one national title, etc. Um, what have you? What have you learned? What has sport uh, helped you to understand um, that you, you know, has helped you personally, or has helped you in your uh, career? 
Hmm. At a level of you know re building relationships when you when you play sport as a young person and often you're um, you play with older people how to engage with older people how to deal with those you know the relationships engagements how to deal with adversity when you lose um, problem solving I think you know when you're playing team sport or any type of sport and you've got a competitor that's beating you and they're doing something how do you think about how you might attack the situation how do you find a different way yeah, how do you find a different way how do you bring people together how do you bring different personalities mm. together because team sports that you know you've all got one goal but you've got so many different um, you know approaches uh, how do people get motivated on game day you know some people are and all about the noise and the action and yeah, the noise and the music and, and some external. people are like you know just don't talk to me yeah. I don't want to so and at the time when you're in the middle of it you don't realize any of those things but it's not until you start leading teams of people later on you realize that those experiences that you've had in those um, you know team sport environments I think there's a there's also a, um, a fascination with sport around the, the winning piece you know the whole you know the, the power of actually the fun of winning and losing and those, those learnings is um, um, is also yep. can be transferred into a business environment. Yep. <laughs> what do they say? Winners go to the bar and losers have meetings. <laughs> That's right. Well, it's very true. Uh, the breakthrough we're always interested in how culture affects an organisation, and uh, I think culture is, is very front and centre for sporting organisations, uh, not only for the teams that they have in their their organisations, but the wider wider group and the pressure you face as a sporting organisation because as a sporting organisation you're judged on performance literally every single week and uh, we've talked about this fact that you can be doing a million great things in your business but if your team, your, your number one team is uh, losing or, or winning that's kind of what uh, dictates an element of culture. So interested to uh, understand how do you deal with that in that, that environment when you've got that constant external, external pressure and then what's your what's your view of, of culture and how do you try to try to influence it as a CEO you've got to be careful that winning doesn't um, isn't your culture because I think that's uh, interestingly the Australian cricket team and Australian cricket have had some really interesting cultural reviews and studies over the last um, 18 months where mm -hmm. did did winning I mean they you know they did a review which is now public and they got to the stage where winning actually got in front of what they culture and what, what, it, what they yeah. believed in so I think that that's an interesting mm. piece when you're talking about sport is mm. you know where is your line where's your line in the sand you know winning is obviously such an important part to our business and the, the not winning when your hero product which is your shop front is not performing as you said uh, you know that the view is that everything in rugby Australia is broken if the Wallabies aren't winning well that's just not true but the flip side is true when the Wallabies are winning everyone yeah. assumes everything else is going yeah. well as well so everything's great this week yeah everything's Great this week, yeah. No, it's been. A, it has certainly um, been a much more enjoyable trip to New yeah, Zealand, yeah, knowing yeah. we can go to the Bledisloe Zone with a chance of winning it. But um, culture for me um, is not um, about missions or visions. It's about the people and what they do inside the business and what how the leaders actually behave and do they. Uh, live to the cultural values and do they set the culture you know do they call out bad behavior are they prepared to build trust and respect my, one of my one of the best piece of advice I got from my mentor was he said I can see by watching these people that if you ask them to follow you off a cliff they would follow you off the cliff but he said being authentic is really important and being that leader is really important but don't get so close that you can't kick their ass so I think that Building culture is about building the safe environment that people feel yeah. inspired and supported um, and that the leaders are living the values. Being able to live to that culture, having the people around you um, and be it your staff or colleagues trusting um, that you're living to whatever culture it is that, that you've set, um, but that you're prepared to make the hard decisions. And that's where the respect bit comes in because I think if you've built the trust and mm -hmm. respect, mm -hmm. um, you can have people leave the organisation um, because you've had to make them redundant or move them in a much more respected way because they can see that it's part of a bigger bigger yeah. picture. So yeah. it's a fine balance to get it right, but um, being able to lead with positivity and set an environment that feels supportive and inspiring and um, aspirational, but also knowing that when the when the rubber meets the road, um, that you're prepared to make the hard decision is also mm -hmm. a really important part of that. Mm -hmm.
Yep. And I think so often as leaders, we're uh, paralyzed with fear around employment law and those kind of things. Actually, continuous open conversations with, with teams make a huge difference. I've, I've dealt with far less people than you, but I've, I've found that having a direct conversation with people going, is this the right thing? Can we help you be better? Do you want to stay here? All those kind of, kind of questions, they're a whole lot better than um, going, let's get some lawyers in the room and, and you know, sort this out because it doesn't work for anyone. Yeah, that's right. And, and whether that's a very pragmatic um, you know, settlement agreement, yeah. what gives yeah. everyone comfort that you've done the right thing by an employee, mm. they've got a three to six month transition to be able to mm. go off and do, um, you know, find a job and maybe, you know, end up with a little bit of double banking because mm. if they get a job quickly, they can be ahead of the game. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think that, that piece is, um, um, you know, can just be a really pragmatic way of approaching it. But I think the other pieces, um, you know, I've had a couple of staff resign in the last week, both of whom are incredibly valuable people to mm. our organisation yeah. and people I really enjoy working with. But one of them's done six and a half years. Yeah. Um, and it's time for her to go. Mm -hmm. You know, our friends at the NRL have stolen her to lead a new programme. It's a step up for her. It's a great positive move for her. Mm -hmm. So to be able to say to someone, um, you know, I'm really disappointed that you're leaving, but mm. it's also the right decision. Yeah. And, and be be supportive of mm -hmm. them making that transition. Mm -hmm. I think is important. Mm -hmm. And then the other person is someone that um, you know is taking a personal career step. Uh, and to be able to be supportive of that person and recognising that you know that you're supporting them to make that career step, I think is important. You know, I've worked in organisations too that you know that once you say you're resigning, they're going to march you out the door and. Yeah. But if you can create an environment where people would rather come to you and sit and say, you know, this is my next career move, I think there's an opportunity here, I'd much rather they did that and we can work through it together. Mm -hmm. For a transition for our own organisation, for yeah. their career development, yeah. that's a much more positive place yeah. for everyone to be. And you can't always see the future, but for leaders to be continually having conversations so they've got an awareness of where that person is trying to head and you know, just it's it's never always going to be in your organisation. There's going to be things that they aspire to that you may not be able to count, uh, cater to because of structure or timing or, or whatever, but as leaders, if you're having those conversations, you've got an awareness then the ability to plan and, and those things not to turn up as a surprise is a whole lot easier. Yeah, and, and also as an individual, um, sometimes it's much harder to step change your career inside an organisation. Mm. Um, actually, what you need to do is leave the organisation. That's the opportunity to take the big step in either responsibility and or remuneration because it's easier for an, sometimes for an internal employer mm. with an employee to think, oh, I'll just give you that much more, but in the outside world you might be worth that much more and that's human yeah. nature. So, you know, being objective both as an employee to mm -hmm. think about those options and an employer to support mm -hmm. that transition I think is mm -hmm. important. Okay. Um, you made mention of a mentor. Um, how important do you think it is for people to have, have mentors in their, in their growth? I, I think it's really important. I, I think two bits are important. Mentors are one and sponsors are the other. Um, so I think the piece about mentor is that uh, they work most effectively when it's someone that it aligns with your fundamental style, culture, approach. Because mm -hmm. you know we've all been through those situations where someone goes, I'm going to give you a mentor, and you sit down in the first coffee meeting and think, Oh my goodness me, this is not going to work. Because their fundamental start yeah, yeah, yeah. point to approach something yeah. is just so different to how you do it. You end up mm. either second guessing what you're doing, um, or, um, and, you know, and I suppose when I just say that, there is times where if you were really on the growth learning curve, that then you might need someone that really opens your mind. If you're not a open-minded, generalist sort of type person, maybe having someone that challenges that would be a good mm. thing. But for me, um, the person that I have, um, David Jackson, um, he ran uh, toll resources like $4 billion and you know, massive business and, and a real people person. So mm. for him, it was always all about the people. Mm. So whenever I ring him with a problem, we sort of start in the same place. So I'll say, oh, I've done this. What do you think? And he'll go, yeah, that's, you know, that's good. But what about also doing this and this? But yeah. it adds to what you're yeah, doing yeah, yeah. as opposed to going, no, no, go off down yeah, there. Sure. Because that would be. So I think yep. there does need to be mm -hmm. a meeting of the minds um, around that. It doesn't mean that um, whenever you get an opportunity to be mentored or coffee with someone, you can't learn something from them. Mm. But whether they're a career mentor or not, I'm not sure. Mm. Um, and then I think the other piece is around sponsorship. And that's having 
someone who uh, helps you in corridor conversations. So when those informal conversations happen that says, I'm looking for a new such and person, chief executive say, to do this role and so George rings Harry, what you need Harry to say is, oh yeah, Raylene, I think Raylene's capable of doing that job, you should talk to her. Mm. And, and if I look at the sort of some of the gender imbalance that we've got still in senior leadership roles, much of it happens because when George rings Harry, Harry gives four boys names. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm an absolute advocate for finding those men and women inside leadership roles that advocate for the best people, regardless of gender, uh, to make sure that the jobs that happen that don't get advertised, that get which shoulder tapped, which is most of the big ones, that sort of... Um, belief, trust, model, underwrite and support that happens in informal conversations, more and more is, is the female opportunities or the female executives are at the table and part of those conversations. And there's more and more of those senior men who are realising that they can make an enormous difference by being sponsor of young, capable women. Um, and, you know, women do it, you know, innately now because they're in those leadership roles. But... That's a that sponsorship piece um, is is equally as important. So it might not be as deep and personal as a mentorship, but being able to ring one of those senior. The other the other little thing for me is that CVs. This whole thing about references on yeah. request. No, no, put the list of people yeah. on your CV because yeah. if you've got some big hitting names yeah. and you're in a pile of twenty CVs, yeah. you want to be separated. So yeah. list those people. Tell them in advance. You know, no one's going to ring them until they've spoken to you anyway. Yeah. But the opportunity, so uh, to have that um, those people yeah. and know that they can advocate for you um, is incredibly. And I, you know, I don't know for me, like in you know, the, getting appointed into the Rugby Australia role, the list of people that I had on that on that. Um, whilst I'd never worked for them directly, the fact that they had seen me out and about and knew me and yeah. could advocate for me was incredibly powerful. And that comes back to um, time invested with people over a very long, long time, not um, going, oh, I wonder who would be good to have on my CV. I'll see if they're prepared to do it, even though they don't know me at all, right? Yeah. Because it's, yeah, it doesn't work like that. No. So investing the time, time overall. Uh, New Zealand Netball. Um, you were a young CEO when you took over that uh, business. Um, what are you most proud of, of what you've achieved at Netball New Zealand? Uh, probably the commercialisation of the sport. I think it was at a stage where it was semi-professional and we were part of the group that moved it into a, you know, having wholly professional athletes, its first big grown-up broadcast deal, um, uh, launching a professional, semi-professional and professional competi trans-Tasman competition. So taking it um, to a place where female athletes in New Zealand yeah. could be professional athletes right. and earn a living out of it, mm -hmm. and that was not you know, possible before then. Was it the first sport in New Zealand to achieve that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I don't think there was, yeah, it's in the female space. Yeah. You know, probably cricket latterly um, yeah. you know, did it, and, and that then our female athletes are, you know, get paid really well. and. Um, there was probably a few individual soccer players probably playing football overseas, but yeah, and that was it, I'm um, was you know really proud of, to be part of the team that put that that program together and launched you know a, a semi-professional professional women's competition that enabled netball to be you know in that space was uh, yeah it was you know really special. Mm. Sure. In uh, post netball New Zealand, you went mm. to what many would observe as a challenging environment. Went to the National Rugby League competition in, in Australia, took the chief executive role at Canterbury-Bankstown, and plenty of people, I think myself included, went, wow, and are you sure? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> yep. um, you know, obviously a very male-dominated environment overall at a, at a club level, at a board level, at a, a National Rugby League level. Some views on the world that were probably not as not as liberal by some of the um, supporters in the in the community. Um, I think when you first got announced as the Chief Executive there was a few people that referenced um, I think females still belong in the kitchen. I remember one of the uh, social media posts. It was a, a phenomenal leap for you to for you to take. What was your first experiences like in inside Canterbury Bankstown? Oh, and the other bit was a, a New Zealander going into an Australian environment. I think was pretty, uh, pretty sensational as well. What what was your uh, initial environment like? It's interesting as I uh, look backwards now. 
I probably realised how brave it was, but I didn't really think about it in that context at the time. What I'm going to say next is going to sound really, um, I don't see myself as female in the female context. I just see myself as a chief executive that's got some skills to do a job. So in, in when I walk into the room, I don't walk into the room thinking, oh my goodness, I'm the only female here. I forget I'm the only mm. female. Like mm. it takes someone to look around and go, yeah. oh, actually. So it, it doesn't, it's... So how, how do you think you develop that mindset? Oh, I think it's how we got brought up. Because I don't think mum and dad treated us, you and I, any differently. I still oh, played. I they treated you a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> I've probably got a different view of that. Um, I, I just don't think they, whilst not being particularly uh, political in their views of thinking about women's equity and yeah, all of that stuff, feminism, feminism they just innately, we did everything. We, all, we both did sport. We both played um, in the garage with hammers and nails. For me growing up, and, and I suppose going to a co-ed school maybe as well, like to me, it, it was never about boys and girls. It was just about leadership. and. And um, I don't know, I've never thought about it. If I, if I did think about it, I probably wouldn't get out of bed in the morning because the weight, I know that, you know, the weight of responsibility of being the first female CEO appointed into the NRL, um, I sort of carried a, a, I suppose, a responsibility because the alternative of failing mm. uh, is catastrophic, right? Because yeah. because that maybe that opportunity is not presented again. but. When I first arrived, I don't believe that you get um, respect with title. Mm -hmm. You get respect because of what you do and how you go about it. Mm -hmm. So you've got to earn that. And that takes time, it takes relationships, it takes... Um, and I, I, I qualify this by saying I went into a business at the Bulldogs that was in really good shape. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to go in there and crisis manage something that was in a really horrible position. Yeah. So it was stable, it was mm. working really well, Todd mm. Greenberg had left it in really good shape, mm -hmm. the board were good. Um, so you've got the luxury of taking some time, doing more listening than talking, um, building some relationships, and really, you know, I'm sort of um, probably three months to six months. I think I describe it as like a drinking out of the fire hydrant. When you say any new job, it doesn't matter what new job you start, sure. you drink out of the fire hydrant. So the first few weeks, it's like, <laughs> and it comes at you overwhelming. and overwhelming. And you realize you're only capturing just a little bit. Sure. And then suddenly over six months, you get down and you realize that you're drinking out of the garden hose mm -hmm. and you can actually kind of manage it. Um, and so, and, but over that six month period, you get a chance to understand who's who, who's coming at you for the right reasons, who's not, who's got agendas, who's supportive, who's got, um, your, who's got your back, yeah. where the competent and capable staff are, mm -hmm. where the shortfalls are, what changes you might have to make. So you can do that over a, a you know, period of time. Um, and for me, it just had to be, you know, the, all of those things that you said are true, the environment in NRL, the, you know, the tough nature of the sport, the, the high profile perspective, there's a curiosity factor which you have naturally, um, if I had a dollar for every time one of my team members has been asked, so what's she really like, <laughs> is, you know, is, is fascinating, you know, the people sort of have a fascination with it. But, you know, it's just about, you know, building those relationships and, and recognising that one, that they're working in a supportive, trusted environment and they can trust you. And secondly, you can help them. If you can make them be better or you can clear the way for them to do their job better or you can unlock some funding for them to do, you know, something they need to do. Those are just, that's just the part of it. And then I suppose the public bit for me was getting out and about in the environment at, in Kateri Banks Town. I think, mm -hmm. you know, I went and sat with the fans for a game and quite early on in the first mm -hmm. season. And mm -hmm. so they saw that I was real and yep. they could touch me and talk to me and, yep. you know, do those types of things. I mean, and, and those those sorts of things are sometimes they're appropriate in those situations. I know David Jackson, who was CEO here of... Um, Kiwi Rail, he would once a year, he'd get and sit with a train driver and do a trip from Auckland to Wellington. Because mm -hmm. he said, the train driver knows everything. Totally. They know what's going on. Yeah. So how do you get to those people so yeah. that someone tells you the real story, mm -hmm. not actually what you think that they want, to, or that what you want to hear? You have a lot of um, females and males, but uh, obviously females uh, looking up to you, going, you know, maybe I'd like to be like railing one day. I'd love to have a have a job like that. Uh, one thing that our generations, you know, almost all of us deal with now is social media and 
uh, having such a high public profile. Um, you've had a, a torrent of uh, social media. What guidance would you give to um, people? You know, it doesn't matter what they're aspiring to be, but just the it could be the um, the fourteen year old girl, your niece, um, who's sitting in a room, kind of trying to get her head around life, and is and is under maybe attack on on social media. What would be your guidance? What insight, advice would you give someone who's who's dealing with that? Yeah, it, it is hard. I mean, I you know the the modern day word is trolled on social media. I mean, I get trolled regularly, um, and it's it's really horrific. Like, it, you know, I do a leadership presentation, I put some of them on the board, and yeah, the whole audience goes <clears throat> when they when they see it. Yeah. Um, well, I don't read it. Um, I think the the detriment is I also am not active on social media in a way that it probably in a, I could really be in a really positive way. But the reality is, unless I talk about rugby, males rugby, and we'll say the Bulldogs, unless I talked about the Bulldogs or I talk about the Wallabies, there's a section of the population that don't think I should talk about anything else other than those, even though I'm talking about the Wallaroos or, you know, our Women's Sevens team, mm-hmm. they only really want to hear about. So um, how do I deal with it? Uh, I've got four or five trusted advisors, and if they tell me I got it wrong, that's when I sit up really straight. That's when I might have a sleepless night worrying about the feedback I've had from someone think, saying to me, oh, you know, you really got that one wrong. Because the hard thing about social media is that um, people invariably don't have any of the facts or even half the facts or some of the facts, so that's just their opinion. Um, it's not something they'd say to you in the street. They wouldn't be brave enough to walk up to you in person and, and say, you know, this is what I think of you. Uh, and... You know, the good piece of advice I got was when you're in the media, don't read the media. So mm. when you're right at the centre of everything, mm. I'm lucky to have a comms advisor, so he reads it mm. and he says to me, this is, the, oh, the, this is what you need to know and here's yeah. the main themes coming out of today. Because mm. that, be, that can be challenging to deal with. Um, but it's those four or five people that I have that I know, um, the rest of it's just noise, just white noise, whatever. Yeah. And, and also, and what I'd say to the 14 year olds out there is, you know, that whole thing of, why, just be nice to people. You know, if you haven't got yeah, something to nice, nice, don't say anything at all. Like, I, I really, I don't understand this whole, you know, that you would be, my, I, one of my, my personal pet hates is bullying. I, you know, I, I just um, uh, write from, you know, when I was younger, if I've ever seen that or, you know, um, I, I take can remember, a, I can remember you coming to my uh, rescue, I would call it, in the uh, primary school playground when a uh, few bigger boys were, um, giving a bit of a rough up and uh, big sister came in and sorted them out. Yeah. Well I was only telling the story last night actually we had uh, you know, a drink with our very long term friend Claudine uh, and uh, you know, I got sent home from school when I was about eight because there was a, a girl who was picking on Claudine and I said stop picking on Claudine and she said you know, she didn't, she kept so, so I actually slotted a one <laughs> and broke my little finger and got sent home yeah. um, you know, in the sick bay principal calling mum saying you're going to come bring yeah. your daughter you know? and I, I remember distinctly sitting at home and having um, dad, dad arriving home from work and he couldn't work out whether he wanted to growl at me or hug me because <laughs> he was sort of proud but you know and I'm not advocating for hitting people I'm not saying no. that's appropriate no. but I, st- I, I really detest bullying I don't, it's pointless I don't see what anyone gets out of it um, and I think more people should call it out um, and make sure they, they are brave enough if you talk about true leadership that's in a group of equals Um, that, you know, particularly in that school age where you're prepared to stand up and say, I'm sorry, but that's not acceptable and I don't agree with that. But being brave enough to call out bad behaviour, I think, is something that, you know, I've, um, you know, always tried to do. And being popular or the most popular person is not the outcome of good leadership. Okay. If you could have one business superpower, what would it be? Make the Wallabies win. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah. Just just the uh, the game this weekend, or uh, maybe World Cons- Cup would be quite handy as well. Consistently, quite nice. What advice would you now give your twenty year old self? If you said to me at twenty you'd end up as CEO of Rugby Australia at forty eight, mm-hmm. I would have said. I mean, I tell the story. I was. Uh, when I was at Xerox in nineteen ninety nine, we were the sponsors of the Rugby World Cup, and um, I took a group of thirty um, s- staff and sponsors. Um, as the uh, you know marketing person that was basically the trip mm-hmm. um, support person uh, to the Rugby World Cup, which we went the final was at Cardiff, and I sat in the stand um, watching Australia lift that trophy and saw um, John Ells hold the trophy up, 
and that's 20 years ago if you'd said to me when I was sitting in that stand 20 years ago you'll end up working with Johnny Eels as a colleague mm. and mm. you know being the CEO of Rugby mm. Australia I would have said to you you're mad like it's crazy but you know, so I don't know what, I don't know really, I've ended up, um, you know, I was so, so fortunate. The thing I'd probably, is I probably in my first 10 years at Xerox, I loved it, I had great experiences. Did I coast a bit too much in those first 10 years? Could I have actually maybe really had a bigger plan and pushed a bit harder, maybe? Would it have ended up in a better outcome? <sighs> Who knows, I don't know, I don't know. But I've been, yeah, really, really fortunate in the steps that I've taken and I'm a great believer in, um, you need um, you know, a good sort of plan, you need to be always looking for opportunities and you also need a really healthy dose of luck. Yeah. So you need the right things to open yeah. up at the right time. And, and again, as an observer, I think your willingness to back yourself has been immense. And I think we, uh, you know, mass generalisation, but we, we see that thing in um, the market where uh, a guy and a girl look at a, look at a job ad there's 10 things in the requirements list and the guy goes, oh, I can probably do three or four of those, so I'll apply. And you know, generalizing massively, the woman looks at the list and goes, oh, I can only do seven out of 10, so I won't, I won't apply. And I feel like you've been very much in the, um, look, I can do most of that stuff and I'll back myself to figure it out, put other people around me, do whatever I need to do to, to make it happen. And I think as a, a yeah, again, an observation, you're one, resilience, and two, willing to just actually back yourself, jump in and, and be prepared to figure it out has been immense in your development. Mm, thank you. And one, and one of my favourite quotes is a Richard Branson quote, which is, um, if you get given a great opportunity, take it and then work out how you're going to do it later. Yeah. And I know that's not always practical in every job, as I use that in a narration to the anaesthetist college graduation ceremony. Probably not a great example to an, a group of anaesthetists. You know, just have a crack yeah, and see, yeah, how, you crack, see how you go. Uh, we did get a good laugh yeah. at that one. But you know, I really, you know, I really do, and I, I absolutely agree with your analogy. I still see it all the time now with you know young women that I that I deal with who go, oh, I'm not quite sure whether I've got that enough experience. Mm. And you know, the two things I'd say if we're going to change the inequity gap is, um, you know, you. Got it, you can't get a job you don't apply for, so you've actually got to put yourself in the race. And then when you get offered the job, say no to the first pack of a salary package that you get, um, because that's invariably what the boys do. Uh, and so you've got to, the worst, as I said, and the worst thing that can happen, they've already decided you're the candidate, you're the person that you want. There's nothing unprofessional about saying, no. well, here it is, because yeah, yeah. the worst case is they can say, no, that's the offer, and then you can decide whether you're accepted or not. N often they'll come back with a little bit more or say to you let's review it in six months time um, and the other one is you know every year when you do staff reviews the boys walk in and say um, I think I've been performed at about 98 out of 100 um, and I want a salary increase <laughs> and the woman comes and say oh, I think I've done about 65 out of 100 and never asked for any more money now that's also as you say a generalization sure. Sure. but that's the type of forward behavior that we actually need um, to make sure that we because mm. um, the the pay gap isn't just about um, unconscious bias of people paying boys mm. more mm -hmm. it's the pressure that the yep. men put mm. on the situation mm. to ensure that they get paid more mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. good good insights and, and good advice on a on a personal level uh, you know here at the breakthrough we talk a lot about the uh, what you face in personal challenges something that translates into a into a business role we both are uh, fortunate to um, have an autoimmune condition called um, alopecia um, and maybe for some of our, our listeners that don't know what it's about it's an autoimmune condition that attacks your hair follicles basically your immune system comes in and goes I don't think you're any any good and maybe for um, some of you that are seeing us well certainly seeing me on on video at the moment um, no hair no eyebrows you know no body hair no no anything as a um, male Actually, in the scheme of things, pretty easy to deal with, and I actually see it as a bonus. You know, I'm always the smoothest dude in the room. Never have to shave. Never have to have a haircut. No money on hair product. But as a um, female, um, the challenge of alopecia is, uh, I think, far more immense. You know, um, hair is so associated with the glamour of the female, etc. Um, as someone that's had to deal with alopecia yourself. Um, how have you, you dealt with it? What's been the kind of mental mental element of, of dealing with it? And uh, what has it taught you? Uh, well, if um, 
I wasn't wearing my wig, mm -hmm. we would look like brother and sister. Um, so yeah, um, mine was a bit more gradual than yours. So I sort of lost mine, hair came back, lost mine, hair came back. Um, it's the first time I didn't tell anyone and just sort of dealt with it personally and privately. Uh, but um, because I was in, at Netball New Zealand, a reasonably public role, um, people thought I had cancer. Yeah. Um, so so the Prime Minister even asked you, didn't he? Yeah, they did. Flat out, yeah, John Key was at a function. Have you got pro have you got cancer? I said, oh, no, John, I haven't. Oh, that's good. He said, just a few of my mates got it at the moment. And that's, yeah, it's not yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> no. Um, so when it happened the second time, I decided to go public, and I basically did it for three reasons. One is because I didn't want people to think I had cancer. Two, um, I didn't want that corridor conversation because I was just arrived at the Bulldogs. Oh, the job's too tough for her, hair's falling out. So I want to stop any of that talk. And thirdly, if you're a young person, um, uh, or any age, but if you're a young woman dealing with alopecia, I thought it would be good for me to talk about Absolutely. it. And if I could share my experience with one young person, that would be a positive thing to do. So I talked about it publicly, um, and uh, it, is, um, it is hard. It's really hard. Um, and it's hard because, as you said, it, it is about how you're presented. Women are fundamentally judged as leaders um, on the way they look and how they present themselves. Um, if I look at my social media feed, 25% of the negative um, feedback would be about how I look. My hair, my lipstick, my um, clothes you know, wearing, clothes yeah. they're wearing, how fat Body I shape, am, whatever. you know, all of those things. Uh, and so uh, you do get judged and I can't wear the same suit every day like you could wear the same suit in a different shirt and tie and people would go but I, it's just yeah. not like people that. People might have seen this t-shirt before. <laughs> before. That's right. Yeah. I, think I, I think I've got about 15 of them. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, so you know th those things those things are difficult and now for me you know wearing a wig um, you know traveling I do a lot of traveling a lot of you know nighttime flights it's lo the logistics are more challenging I have to yeah. think about you know headscarves and moving and yep. you know, wigs and transporting and you know, all that stuff um, you know and sure you know you have days where it's like oh for goodness sake but I try and turn it into the positive which is that sort of resilience level and, and recognizing that uh, you know, as I said before, some of those things that come at you that in a lifetime before you would have got really worried about, now you just let wash off you because you're dealing with more important things and more challenging things. And so I've used it as a way to build resilience and strength. Um, you know, it is like I've got, you know, tattooed eyebrows. Now, as I can say, well, I have got a tattoo now, I've got two. <laughs> That's right, which I couldn't say before. True. I have used that a couple yep. of times. Oh, did you, did I got a tattoo. People are like, oh, really? Show I'm us, like, yeah, us. show us. I'm like, oh, there, you know. Um, but yeah, it, it is. You know, sometimes it sucks, right? But it just, it is what it is. And, you know, there's, there is much worse conditions. But it is difficult for young people um, to deal with so you know anything we can do and I've had young females come and approach me and say it's been really great that you've talked about it. Uh, what you talk about is attitude right you everything that presents us in life we have a, a way we can choose to deal with it um, half half full half empty and uh, yeah your uh, amazing propensity to look at uh, challenge in your life and take it at the half full approach um, has been yeah amazing and uh, very proud of you for you what you do there Thank you. what I, what I would say though um, is you can't completely sweep it under the carpet you can't not look it in the eye and you can't not have those um, the tears yeah. and yeah. it's not about pretending it hasn't happened no yeah and um, I did do that, I tried that. So I'm an advocate for um, counselling if you need it, sure. for looking in the eye if you need the moment to have tears and you know, particularly girls. Girl, girls' way of dealing with stuff is to have a good old cry. And all I, of that I stuff is, that's right, all of those things are really important. So I'm not saying that it's all about being steely resilient yeah. and not having those moments. You've got to look it in the face and deal with it. Yeah. But once you realise that there's no, that you can't keep feeling sorry for yourself, you've got to find a way to, yeah. to move forward. So I had to be in Fiji earlier on the week and um, the lady behind the counter said to me, oh, that, <laughs> I don't know why she said it, she said to me, um, your hair's amazing, is that your hair? <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was that moment where it was like, what do I do here? Yeah. I said, no, it's a wig. Oh, the colour's really great, she said. <laughs> oh, right, so you think she was going, is that your natural colour? Yeah, maybe? I think but so. She said, is I that your hair? I don't know. No, no, I borrowed it off someone down the road. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, sometimes it's just easier to say, oh, thank you very much. And yeah. you, you don't embarrass the person by, you yeah. know, saying anything. 
but it was just in that moment it was very funny very funny yeah very good in uh we talk a lot about development at the breakthrough and how people uh, grow and develop themselves um what's an area you'd like to improve one personal and one um, business leadership you know what's a, what's a couple of things you'd like you are or would like to work on more exercise mm -hmm. really bad really mm -hmm. really which is your key pet reminder for me of um and that you know that's just personal discipline to actually say that this is an important part of what you do and um, it's an easy excuse, you know, to be travelling in time zones and not to be able to find time for it. But that's something that I know I need to do better to make sure I know it's better for me and it's better for the people around me if I do. So that's the, probably the personal one. Um, the professional one, I'd really like to go to go to Harvard or to um, Stanford or something and do one of those sort of managerial. Um, you know, I'm not a not a never been a great studier. Like I did, I went school university because I knew if I didn't, I yep. probably would not have mm. gone. That formal sort of learning thing is probably not something that I would enjoy. But the more mature, um, the luxury of, that you have of being able to go to those types of where there's still some formal academic learning, but it's about sharing experiences and problem solving around big things with other really smart people from around the world. That's something that um, is, is for me is something I want to do in the mm. next 24 months. Yeah, nice. Yeah, mm. it'll be an amazing, amazing experience. Mm. Okay, um, what's what's one thing you think you do as a leader that really makes a makes a difference? Two things, but they but they're linked. Um, is ability to take complex um, problems or issues and sort of capture them into three or four sentences, um, and understand the essence of what's going on because you have to be able to do that with 50 balls in the air because of the things that happen on any day for me mm -hmm. um are, you know the, the things that can come at me in any given moment is, is you know 50 150 whatever it is so you have to be able to distill the information and get the big concepts and mm -hmm. be able to think about them and add value to mm -hmm. them and, and you sort of think well how is it that i can do this job and i think for me it's that ability to be able to calmly manage all the things that come at me in a day um, and realise that I actually can juggle a whole lot of things and big important concepts and be able to add value to them. So distill what might be a big paper. And that's why I say to people for me, don't send me an email that's like five pages long, right? Because I just won't, you know, I will struggle. Bill. We are, that's right. Points, but if you give me the bullet yeah. points, then I know what I can do with that information and then I can add value in yeah. to you. And be present, be present at the, in front of the person mm. sitting in front of you. I try hard to do that. Sometimes that's hard when you've got things going on and you know, mobile phones and information, text messages yeah. and all of those things mm. coming at you all the time. But yeah, making sure that when you're sitting in front of someone they feel that you know, they've got your focus mm. and you're present um, is also really important. Mm -hmm. Now, not a lot matters in life, but what matters matters a lot. What matters to you? Friends and family and good people. Yeah, mean mean a lot to me. I think you know that sort of that you know, you know the values that that people have are really important to me. Um, uh, and that you know that's not about you know being perfect or not making mistakes because um, I'm an absolute great believer that everyone gets a chance to make a mistake. Just don't make the same mistake twice. That's what I get really frustrated with that. Um, but yeah, friend, you know, friend. At the end of the day, that's all that matters, really, because the, the rest of it's just it's our job or our title or our house or our car or you know any of those things. But um, having knowing that you've got that love and support of of great people around you is hugely important. And you know that we've got lots of challenges in our society at the moment with you know mental health and domestic violence, which are the, the two things that, two things that I'm particularly passionate about. And you know, when we we're at the Bulldogs, our white ribbon was our um, you know our uh, charity partner and you know um, one in every five women will um, experience significant domestic d domestic or mental violence and that you know that's just not acceptable like, one, that, in in, one in five in a modern wow. society so when you're talking to a conference and I would do it I would yeah, finish yeah, my yeah, presentation yeah. my leadership presentation yeah. and you got 400 people yeah. in the room I see you like to finish on a high note well <laughs> It's quite powerful though. Yeah, it is. When you it's actually an audience, thing. an audience thing, and when you do the numbers, one in five, and eighty people in that room, eighty males in that room will be in a situation where they're putting their partners in, in you know, in that situation, and being brave enough to actually help. So, you know, if I loop that back yeah. into that love and support place, mm -hmm. where 
if you were having either of those things, you would, um, you know, that, that family um, support that you, friends and family support that, you know, I'm lucky to have and we're lucky to have. Um, and for those people that don't have that, to be in a situation where you think that you couldn't leave your partner because you've got nowhere to go, I mean, that's just, you know, horrendous. I mean, I had a situation um, with a football player um, who was, um, you know, culturally domestic violence, very big part of their history and culture. And, um, you know, her mother said to her, go back there, he's earning your children, your children's money, you know, to make sure that they can, I mean, that, you know, like those things are hard to comprehend. But, um, yeah, to, to have that safe family environment or friends environment where you know you can go back to is, yeah, is absolutely critical. Ray, I'd like to acknowledge you for what you've achieved. Um, amazing uh, sister to me, uh, but uh, I um, know you've influenced so many lives directly with your um, uh, employees and people in your teams, but then so many people, my... Um, <laughs> Back in the days when I used to go to a barber, <laughs> um, Sue, who you know, who you know, she was the um, barber, barber Sue, and her her daughter was on the outside looking at you, going, "I'd like to be a, like like Raylene." So the fact that you've been able to um, influence so many lives is uh, just amazing, and that you've done it in a very um, a way of so much humility and connectedness with people is um, amazing. Um, but I do, I do feel like a lot of your success is really due to me. Yeah, of um, course. Because I feel like you, you know, you basically bossed me around for the first twenty years of your life, and it was just really great, great practice. And as a, a leadership example, you know, you literally had me call, call over broken glass when I was, you know, only like three years old. Um, I do have the scars to prove that it <laughs> prove that it happened. So um, whilst you've been amazingly successful, and I'm so proud of you. I feel like there's a little bit of me in that result. I think there is, I agree. It is a great family story. I'm sure, I don't think I made you, although that's your story, I'm not sure I did. And I'm, I'm sticking I'm, with it. I might have just encouraged you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's leadership, right? It is. Yeah, encouraging others to do the things you want them to do. Yeah, yeah no. it's not forcing them. No, yeah. that's yeah. right. No, it is. And, and you know, and I, and I feel really fortunate um, to have had the experiences that I have, um, have had and, uh, it's, I think I said earlier, uh, if I thought about all of those young women, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning with the weight of responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's not ne not meant to be seen as a negative. When people come to you and say, you know, oh, thanks, so I believe now, I, stop me in the street and say, I believe I can do this now, that's truly amazing. But it's not why I do it. It's not, of it's not you know, yeah. it's never been the first thing for me has never actually been about being first. Mm. Um, it's been about wanting that job or yeah. that opportunity. Being the best you can be. Yeah. yeah. And as I say, people say, what do you want to achieve? And I say, well, when they finally put me in a box and someone kind of does a eulogy, um, I just want them to say, she absolutely had a crack at everything, made the most of every opportunity. And um, I don't know. think we'll have too much trouble saying that. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. For sure. This Thank has been very cool. Thanks for joining us. All right. Love.